space. And the only way we can transform it into a sacred space is if you make it sacred. So I'm going to ask two things of you this morning before we start. One, if you have a phone on you, could you turn it off and if you can put it in your pocket so it's not in your hand? Because I really want you to be 100% present for the next 30 minutes. And it's hard to be present if you have your phone in your hand. Also, if you have an earbud, take it out. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is to try not to be distracted by the people next to you. So make a decision if the person next to you is not a good person to sit next to. Maybe you might want to make a switch now. This way, you guys can fully participate in this morning's liturgy. And I'm not inviting you to come up on stage to participate. I'm inviting you to participate from your seats by being present to the next 30 minutes, by each individual here to allow yourself to have this Holy Week experience. Even if you've done nothing during the entire Lenten season, give yourself this time. Because that's what Holy Week's about. It's about to enter into the story, our faith story, this is the most important part of our faith story. I always say Christmas is nice, it's important, we have to have Christmas, but this is it. This is the moment which defines us as Catholic Christians. This is the drama in the story that unfolds, and that's why this week, if you've gone to church on Sunday, if you're going to go to church on Friday, you will see that the Gospel is a dramatic reading, that some churches might have a dramatic presentation, or have four people reading in different parts. A lot of today's storylines and movies and novels are taken out of scripture. It's very powerful. But this is the part of our faith story that defines us, that gives us our identity. It's because what Jesus did during this part of our faith story is why we can call ourselves Christians. And that's why this week is so important. That's why this week we've asked you to stop, to take the time, and to enter into this experience. And so we're doing so today as a school community to help you get focused on Holy Week by grade level. If you've been to this liturgy before, because that's what can happen when we do it over two periods, that's okay. Seeing it for a second time helps you to pick up on things that you didn't see the first time. This is my fourth time. And I'm loving it, and I'm seeing and thinking about things in every liturgy that's different. Because it's helping me enter into this story more deeply. So this morning, I'm going to start with a prayer. And then the drama will unfold. And then I'll come back and bring some closure to this liturgy. So let us begin the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day, of our lives, for the opportunity to grow in faith, to be part of the St. Michael community, and to go deeper into what you have called us to do in this life. Grant us the strength and the courage we need to become better versions of ourselves so we can create a peaceful world, a world where we can grow in mercy and support one another in all our journeys. We ask this prayer through Jesus our Lord. Amen. This morning, Ms. Conqueratt's grade 10 musical theater class and Ms. Dominico's grade 10, or sorry, grade 12 dance class will take us through the passion of Jesus and also help us reflect on the year of mercy. Ashley lives alone with her mother who developed an alcohol addiction ever since her father left them. Usually she tries to slip out of the house without her mother noticing, but this morning as she was leaving, her drunken mother approached her with enraged screaming. Where are you going? 
Ashley tries to leave unharmed, but her mother grabs her arms where her bruises from the last incident remains. She quickly runs off before any more harm is done. Ashley arrives to school feeling anxious and upset, and her best friend Amy notices. She asks, what's wrong? Ashley's reluctant to tell Amy about the abuse that's been brought on to her for so many years, but Amy manages to get the truth out of her. Together they decide to go tell their teacher, Mrs. Jackson, hoping that this will finally put an end to the horror at home. After the girls leave, Mrs. Jackson calls child services. Later that evening, when Ashley and Amy are walking home, they see child services escorting Ashley's mother out the door. Lena, who has just moved to Bolton, is attending her first day at St. Michael Catholic Secondary School. The first half of the day went okay, besides the fact that she did not make any friends. It is now lunchtime and Lena is very nervous as she keeps thinking, where will I sit? Will anyone offer me a seat? What if no one wants me to sit with them and I have to sit alone? How embarrassing. As Lena scopes out the cafeteria, she sees a girl who she recognizes from her morning English class and so decides to go talk to her. Hey, my name is Lena and I'm new here. Are any of these seats taken? The girl rolls her eyes and puts her bag on the empty chair. At that moment, another girl named Vanessa notices that the new girl is being excluded and mistreated, so she walks up to Lena and offers her a seat at her table. Although Lena is still uncomfortable at her new school, at least she knows there is someone who is willing to befriend her. A young girl is walking home from a long day at school. She stops and sees two classmates at the end of the street. She continues walking, trying to avoid them, although at the same time notices a homeless woman and stops. She greets the woman and gives her something to eat. The woman is filled with happiness, smiling at the girl. The girl is happy with what she did until she looks up and sees that the two girls are pointing and laughing at her. They're making fun of what she is wearing and the makeup she has on and what she did. She runs home embarrassed and insecure. She then goes to her room and stares at herself in the mirror. She does not feel beautiful because all she can think about is what the two girls were saying about her. Her sister hands her makeup wipes and she removes her makeup. Her sister brings her to bed and says goodnight. It's a cold winter day when a pale, weak man sits trembling and almost buried in snow. He does not have a warm winter coat nor a hat of any kind. Numerous people pass him by without giving him a second look. Soon, a wealthy woman approaches the man and looks at him with fear. Slowly backing away, she reaches into her pocket and throws a quarter at him. Even though he is grateful, it is not what the man needs, for he lacks dignity, a basic right of all human persons. A few frigid minutes pass, then another woman walks near the man and she notices him, and immediately goes out of her way to help him warm up. She takes the hat off her head and the scarf off her neck as she wipes snow off of the man. The woman gingerly places the warm attire on the man and helps him up. The man is still cold, but this kind gesture has warmed his heart and he gives the woman a bright smile. This is what the man deserved. He needed to be clothed both on a physical sense and on a spiritual one. On a crisp spring night, a teenage boy walks alone through an eerie subway station. He is constantly bullied both at school and online and is seriously questioning his self-worth. The bullies make him feel that he is a waste of space, nothing more than an insignificant little failure, and he is starting to believe them. He makes it to the tracks and is fighting the urge to jump. The boy is terrified, shaking and clutching onto his bag. He feels his phone vibrate in his pocket, a text, probably from those bullies again. This is the final straw. The boy puts one foot over the edge. He has made his decision. Another man realizes something is off with the boy. He sprints to reach him in time. 
boy steps off of the platform just as the man stretches out and grabs his arm, yanking him back and away from the tracks. They both fall into a heap as the first subway car storms by, and bystanders gather in a circle to get a closer look. The man helps the boy up and asks if he is okay. The boy tells the man about his problem as he fights back tears. The man reaches into his pocket and pulls out a water bottle and hands it to the boy. The boy now feels more valued, more important, and more loved than he had before. He looks up and says nothing. The Gospel According to Mark as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes in the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See the charge they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for him according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you, king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Jesus crucified instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with your king? They shouted back. Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has this man done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, handed Jesus over to be crucified.
Cross to come center stage for us right now. And I want us to focus on the cross because this is what we do in Holy Week. We really focus on the journey of Jesus to the cross. And 2,000 years ago, the cross was a symbol of crucifixion, of death. Anyone who was um, sentenced to death, the time of Jesus, they knew what awaited them. They knew that to be executed on the cross was probably the worst thing that could happen because it was a very slow and painful death. You hung on the cross and slowly died painfully. And Jesus knew what awaited him because in Mark's gospel we hear him say, um, you know, if this cup can pass me by God, so he's talking to his father, he said, if I don't have to do this, let this pass me. But if, you, if it is your will, I will do it. And of course it was God's will. And Jesus had to step up and accept this death sentence for something he never did. He accepted this sentence of death so that we can experience forgiveness. And anyone else who continues to be born onto this earth they are given the gift of forgiveness. But 2,000 years later, we have to transform this symbol of death, this symbol of crucifixion, into a symbol of hope. Because for some of us, we've kept it as a symbol of death and suffering. But we need to, each individual here has to make that decision as to what are you going to do with this symbol. And we see it here daily. I started this liturgy by saying, I think I did, this is my fourth liturgy. I could be repeating myself. I'm not sure, so help me out here. But in this calf, we continue to crucify people. Yes? Yes. We don't put them up on the cross. We don't see blood. But we hurt people every day. I don't know why we continue to do this as human beings. We did it this morning in Belgium through, through suicide bombers, have destroyed people's lives today to make a point, innocent people. And innocent people come into this calf every day, into the school, into the halls, into the classroom, and their lives are destroyed by words or a text. Yes? It does, right? So what happened on the stage is pretty real. At school, at home, unfortunately, some of you experienced this at home. And that is tragic. In my first couple of years of chaplaincy at another school, I got a phone call from a student I was sitting in my office. And he said, Miss, I'm at the Islington subway station. Can you pick me up? I decided not to jump. That young boy, whether I think he was grade 10 or 11, because he was still in the school for a few years, I don't remember. But he's now into his mid or late 30s. He's an awesome guy. He does things for the community. He's always advocating for people. It just makes me so proud. But what made me proud is on that day when he was on the edge. That was his cross that day, the edge of the subway platform. And what put him on the edge of the subway platform were the people in his school. So when you say something, when you text something, when you tweet something, when you post something, you have to think about the words that you're putting out there and who are they affecting. By those words, who are you putting on the cross or the edge? And that's what Holy Week's about, is to transform, to take stock of who you are, the decisions you are making, and how do you want to see change? And it starts with yourself. You have to go into your own heart, into your own soul. Because a lot of times, the people that are putting others up on the cross or on the edge, it 
It's because they're hurting. And you don't know what to do with your own pain, so you think, I'm going to hurt someone else. I'm going to create pain for someone else, because I don't know what to do with my own. We have to take a good look in the mirror during Holy Week, look at our own suffering, look at our own brokenness, and ask God to help us. That's why we have faith, ladies and gentlemen. Because God took the journey first. But God is waiting for us to say to him or her, can you help me? Can you help me on my journey? Because I don't know how to do this on my own. And I don't want to hurt anyone else. If we all did that, the world we'd be living in would be totally different. Starting with this cafetorium. So let's pray this morning for all those who are suffering, for all those who are affected by our own brokenness, for all those that are waiting on the edge, that are waiting for a kind word, that are waiting to be accepted. In a school of 12,000, there should be no one here feeling alone. And yet every day, as we saw in this dramatic presentation, there are people that feel alone. So we pray for all those that are suffering, and we pray for our own journey, for our own gift of forgiveness. In this year of mercy, Pope Francis is asking all of us to embark on this journey of mercy, to reach out to people, so that we can also find healing in helping others. So we close with our year of mercy prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, you reveal your love for us in your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the face of mercy. Grant us strength so that we may bring to every person in the St. Michael community your goodness and tenderness during the year of mercy. May we continue to grow in your image, God, so that we can become a source of healing and grace to one another. May our efforts of mercy help build your kingdom of peace. And together we pray, glory be to the Father. St. Michael. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And before I invite Mr. Pickering up here, I want to wish you guys God's blessings to you and your family. May you take the time during Holy Week to make a difference. Thank you, Mr. Good morning, everyone.